All right. Okay, so welcome to the lecture series on quantum cohomology, Nakajima varieties, and quantum groups. So I already was asked to fill a video about what this course is about. It is on the course webpage. So there is a course webpage on the CMSA's website where I filled a short video about what is this about. It has three sections. It has a section on grammar wooden theory, which I just briefly review. Uh, I'm not going to go into gory proofs and detail or computational details of grammar wooden invariance, but nevertheless, I would like to actually, you know, define some of the words. So I think, you know, it is useful. Um, and then um, I will discuss about quantum cohomology and its connections to grammar wooden theory. And then we switch gears to these uh, subject of Nakajima varieties. So I will use plenty of different resources, especially the book that Nakajima himself wrote. Uh, you know, because the, actually, in my opinion, uh, other than the in incredibly amazing computations there, the notation is kind of hard. So I think the book on Hilbert's scheme of points on surfaces that Nakajima wrote is a good source for learning about the, this focus space formalism and things like that. Then we discuss about these uh, connections between um, Heisenberg algebra and these R matrix formalism, plenty of which was developed by Pandre Pandey, Alkunkov, Malik, um, and others who wrote papers with these three guys. And then we do calculations. So some of the calculations we do as, a, an, as an example. My original goal is, final goal, is to learn the following question, whether the quantum cohomology structure of these Nakajima varieties has anything to do with certain other structures of the moduli space of sheaves. For instance, Hall algebra structure. So, that's the goal. And as we will go further and further, you will realize that this was actually gave motivations to some of the most amazing conjectures in algebraic geometry and enumerative geometry. For example, the connection between grammar witten theory and Donaldson-Thomas theory could, in, in principle, be realized as the connection between um, quantum cohomology of Nakajima type varieties and shift theory. Okay, so let me just briefly overview grammar witten theory for you. Um, so, grammar within theory is a certain theory which discusses moduli space of stable maps to a fixed uh, target variety. But before that, there are some other relevant moduli spaces which are simpler in the structure, which I need to first mention. So, let's just start with the moduli space of stable curves, rather. So, some relevant moduli spaces. So first, some relevant moduli spaces. So the first one that I would like to discuss is called MGN. So what is this? Parameterizes um, projective non-singular non-singular curves C of genus G with N marked points P1 to Pn. These are smooth points. The curve is smooth. And this thing marked points P1 to Pn on C. Okay, so things like this. P1 to Pn. You can add a marking to the curve. Okay, so then you might need to allow these curves to have deformations. And, then, and if they deform, they might uh, lose the property of being non-singular. So those kind of curves you can realize in a compactification of this moduli space. So MGN has a compactification. which is called M bar GN, 
whose points correspond to um, projective projective connected, this is important, projective connected curves, connected nodal curves. So now we allow singularities in the curve. Nodal curve, C let's say, together with N distinct um, non-singular mark points. Mark points. Mark points with a stability condition. Equivalent to to um, the finiteness of automorphisms of the curve, of the pointed curve. Automorphism, finiteness of automorphism groups. So groups of such pointed curves. So now your curves are nodal curves. They could be pictures like this, P1, P2, having nodes on them, with a certain stability condition which guarantees that this whole thing has finite automorphisms. Okay, so remember that now I'm just discussing the moduli space of curves, not the stable maps. Stable maps, moduli space is related to the moduli space of curves. Actually, there's a morphism between the two moduli spaces. Okay. Okay, so now notation may be M bar G1 genus G curves with one mark points is often called the universal curve. So is often called the universal curve. Curve over MG over just honest moduli space of genus G curves, no marking. I mean, the one mark points actually sees the curve, right? So, all right. Remark. Um, M bar G N compactifies. And GN, the smooth locus, without allowing, without allowing, this is important, without allowing points to come together. So when points come together, when points come together, the curve splits into uh, two or more connected components, connected components, and Mark points get distributed on the smooth points of these connected components. So these connected components. Okay. 
So for instance, um, in this compactification, if you have some picture like this curve, and they come together, the curve is split, might is split into one or more pieces like that, like this maybe. Okay, or or could be also things like this. We will discuss this further. Some of the principles that actually show you how how this this splitting happens. Also, it has to do with the the you know the rate or the speed of approach of these points with respect to one another. Okay. Think about blow up in algebraic geometry. Okay, so another remark. Um, M bar GN are smooth stacks orbifolds, coarse moduli spaces. Um, of dimension. 3g minus 3 plus n. If you don't need know what a stack is, don't worry about it for now. Orbifold, you probably know. It's something that locally looks like quotient of a manifold by a group. Reductive group. Right? So locally, these things, the coarse moduli space looks like quotient of a smooth variety by group. Okay? And these groups are often the automorphism groups that parameterize different types of curves being parameterized by the moduli space. These are stabilizer groups. Obviously they are finite groups by the very construction of the moduli space and the choice of the stability condition for these curves. Okay. Um, so, another part of this remark is the following. M bar 0n, genus 0, rational curves with n mark points, is a fine moduli space fine moduli space and a non-singular variety. Here, stability is Finiteness of automorphisms translates uh, as follows. Stability is each component um, of the curve of the curve C must um, have at least at least um, three special points. And I call it a special, and I don't call it a marked point. I call it a special point because that means node or a marked point. So either marked points or a node or nodes. Where the components meet each other. Okay. All right. I think Delina and Monfort are the people who studied this this much like this more than anyone else. And the moduli space of the stable maps, you can correct me, but if you're working in particular on this field, but moduli space of the stable maps, I think, was motivated by string theorists who wanted to embed curves inside an ambient target variety. But this is much older object than the moduli space of the stable maps. Okay. Um, so let me 
mention some examples of this modular space M0, M bar 0 N. So let N be equal to 3. In that case, the modular space of rational curves with three mark points on them. If you give a, a P1, there's a natural choice of choosing three distinct points on P1. We all know that. Those are the points 0, 1, infinity, for instance. So you can fix these things. And the modular space of rational curves with three mark points is just a point. Right? The modular space is realized by how many ways you can parameterize the object you would like to parameterize. And here is just, you have a distinct choice of three mark points on the P1, so it's just a point. So, so the dimension may be, I write it like this, dimension of this thing is zero, a point. Now, if n is equal to four, then let's see what's the dimension. The dimension of this thing, what was the formula? It was 3g minus 3 plus n, genus is 0, so it is 1. So the three of these points we can fix easily on a p1, but then you have a choice for the fourth point, and that gives you the moduli. So this parameterizes four uh, distinct mark points. Um, on P1, or on a curve isomorphic to P1, a rational curve. Um, so since up to um, isomorphism, one can fix three of these points. One can fix the first three, if let's say, the first three. Of these points, um, say zero, one, infinity, then m bar zero four is kind of isomorphic to p one minus these three minus these three the special points. That's the moduli. That's the choice that you have. You remember, it's P1 minus these three because, as I mentioned, the points cannot approach to each other. If you fix the, the first three, your fourth point cannot lie on the, on the top. But then you have the many possibilities. So, and these three points uh, of the P1 actually give you a way of looking at different configurations of these mark points. So, for instance, um, so for instance, if you have a curve that looks like this and with four mark points, you can, I can distribute four mark points on this curve. So for instance, I can have something like this, fix a particular ordering of these markings, and then remember that my moduli space is like a P1 together with these three points. So let's, let me draw for the moduli space, a P1 in here. This is the moduli space we know from the dimension. So this picture associates to a point zero in the P1. And then I can change the configuration of these points. So for instance, I can make this one, three, two, four. The three of which I fix and I get a, well, it's a different configuration, so it's different than this picture. That is one. And then I can, Takes the configuration one, four, two, three. That is infinity. This is what this picture is saying. So your moduli space. So each time that you fix a configuration of these markings on the actual curve, you get a point on that P1. You get these divisors on the on the P1. The point given that the P1 has dimension. One is a divisor on P1. So each fixed configuration gives you a divisor on the moduli space. OK. So in, in fact, remark, in 
fact. Um, so let's see the low side, the set of the set. That's why I would like this the low side of types of um, given combinatorial type. Turns out to be a smooth sub varieties, sub varieties of m bar zero n, and all such loci meet transversely. Okay, so these are these are smooth sub varieties of the moduli space. You see, this is the moduli space, it's a P1. The smooth sub variety of the moduli space is a point. What's the transverse intersection of two lines? We understand that pictorially. What's the transverse intersection of points? It means no intersection. Okay, um, so the stability here, so let me mention this. Um, okay, okay, so let's, let's write it like this. So there is a divisor, in fact. There is a divisor, let's call it DAB, in M bar 0 N for each partition partition a b of um, n into two disjoint sets n here is 4 These are partitions of n into two disjoint set, sets. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, how do I show it this way? This is 1, 3, 2, 4. This is 1, 4, 2, 3. Maybe I can put a like this, yeah. Each one of these combinatorial partitions of the total number of mark points on a curve gives you a divisor. This divisor, this point, as a divisor in the P1, is the divisor of this partition. So on and so forth. Okay. Stability here is that each um, each subpartition A or B should have at least two elements. So for instance in here we cannot have a partition where 2 is on here. If it has one element, then that component that has only one mark points has moduli, and it has infinite automorphism, so it's not a stable. It rotates around, around that point. When you fix 2, given that this is a nodal curve, for instance, it becomes a stable. OK. A generic point. Point of this divisor, we have A dash B, or partition B, is represented by 
two lines meeting transversely transversely like this. You have a bunch of points in here and you have a bunch of points in here. And this is partition A and this is partition B exactly as that picture. Okay. Any questions so far? Now, for those of you who came a bit later, I am covering some of the notations, definitions, properties, important things to remember in subject of grammar of wooden theory. The source for this is the Mirror Symmetry and Algebraic Geometry book by Sheldon Katz and David Cox. Um, also, the notes on quantum cohomology by Fa uh, Fulton and Pandari Pandey. We, we discussed gramma within theory for a while, two or three sessions. Then we discussed quantum cohomology after that. Okay. These are truly basic, I mean, but I try to mention the most important things. Maybe some here and there, maybe little proofs and so on, but I wouldn't go through very gory detail. Okay? All right. Okay, so what is the most important thing to remember is this line. Now we know what's the generic point of that divisor in the modular space look like. That's it. Okay, now denote M bar G A modular space of Modular space of genus G curves where A is the um, labeling set, labeling, labeling set of endpoints. You fix the endpoints, you give it labels. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it's a labeling set. All right, now let B inside A be a, a subset. Subset. So, for instance, if I label 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 5, then there exists. A forgetful um, morphism, forgetful morphism, which takes you from this M bar G A to M bar G B. It forgets those things which are not in B. So it forgets uh, points in A minus B, okay. okay, so we have something like that. On the open locus, now this is the fun part, on the open locus, um, this map is the obvious one. Okay, so for instance, if I have something like this, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm forgetting the fifth labeled set. So here my A is one, two, three, four, five. B is one, two, three, four. On the open locus of the modulus, like this, where the curves cannot become singular, they are just non-singular, is the obvious one. Forget the labeling. Okay? But on the 
but on the boundary of M bar, for instance, GA, on the boundary, removing points, removing points um, might lead to lead to instability. Instability or instability? In, <laughs> okay, uh, instability. Instability. So for instance, let's look at the map, forgetful map pi, like how I said it there, m bar 0, 5 goes to m bar 0, 4, where I fix the labeling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here I fix the labeling 1, 2, 3, 4. So it forgets um, the fifth marked point. So on the boundary, let's see what happens. Remember that on the boundary of these marginalized spaces, you can have all different types of these nodal curves where they have, you know, some, uh, some um, distribution of points on them. So we can just think about some of them. So for instance, what does the map pi do to something like this? One, two, three, four, five. If I forget the fifth point, there is a component that doesn't have three special points on them. And the special points means node or a mark point, right? So it naturally needs to go to two, three, and then a four. But this cannot happen. So that component, which is unstable, gets contracted to a point, goes away. So it gets, degenerates to something is stable. Collapses that component. So the forgetful map doesn't see this, but sends it to there. Similarly, if you have something like this, which could as well happen uh, on the boundary of the moduli space, some curve like that, you can have a 5 in here, you can have a 2 and 4 in here. The map that forgets the fifth label point, if I remove this thing in here, this component doesn't have three special points, it has two. So this component contracts to a point, so you will get 1, 3, a node, and then 2 and 4. Actually, a lot of basic computations in, in gramma Witten theory, you can find these in the papers, and it's really amazing, are really done by looking at pictures like this. You have a rule, just obey the rule, and you can calculate. Okay. So that's that. For any subset, um, a, B, C, D of four integers in the set of n numbers and elements, n, there exists a morphism m bar 0, n2, m bar 0, i, j, k, l or A, B, C, D, okay, forgetful morphism, as long as, I mean, you obey this law. Um, the inverse image, the inverse image of a point, let's say, particular point where I fix the partition to be A, B, and then C, and D. 
A, B, and then C and D is given by the sum of... Uh, remember that every time you have fixed these partitions like that, you get a divisor in the moduli space. But now, remember that over here, as soon as... Here, this is the moduli space of rational curves with four mark points. Four mark points can... But then, I would like to look at the inverse image in here. So there are certain divisors in here, which after forgetting those points, give me the divisors in here, induced by this fixed labeling. But which divisors are they? There are different types of divisors that eventually, after forgetting n minus four points, give me configurations like this. So it's given by the sum of those things, sum of um, sum of uh, sum of divisors. Hmm. Let's call it DAB, such that, first of all, A union B is the set N, and A and B is an A, and K and L, and K and L is in B. Right? That's the only thing we know. Okay? The fact that the three points, three points in M bar zero uh, A B C D, which is isomorphic to P one, we discussed that are linearly incoherent. Implies that. Um, they are inverse images in uh, M bar 0n are also linearly equivalent. Remember that for m bar 0, 4, we discussed that this is a P1. Each time I fix the configuration, I get a divisor on that P1. The point 0, 1, infinity. These three divisors are linearly equivalent. These things are in here. And the pullback of this thing in here gives you divisors, which got to be also linearly equivalent. So let me write that down in a better form. What I mean by that is that hmm, that is the sum of uh, those divisors a b where a and b is in a and c and d is in b is equal to linearly to the sum of divisors d a b where a and uh, C is in A, and B and D is in B, which is the same as some of those divisors where A and D is in A, and B and C is in B. The simple facts, you know. So the significant significance of mapping this thing onto the moduli space of rational curves with four points is that that moduli space of rational curves with four points has a very nice structure. We know what it is. It's a P1 with three distinct points on them, which are linear equivalent. So as soon as we understand that there's a forgetful morphism between the two moduli spaces, we can use the see that's what are the properties of the moduli space downstairs that can get lifted upstairs. So this is why we are doing this. Okay. And these divisors are, you know, they are co-dimension ones of varieties. So if you want to, if you're interested in cohomology theory, for instance, these are things in co-dimension one. This induce co-dimension one cohomology classes. So these all live in, if you like, Chow groups. So you can use Chow group notation. These 
classes all of them. Induce cohomology classes of co-dimension one. Okay. Maybe I write it. <coughs> okay. Um. Actually, um, Keel. Is, is, is his name Sean Keel? Sean, right? Sean Keel. Keel has proved that. Keel um, has shown that um, the classes of these divisors, these type of divisors, generate the cohomology ring. homology ring of the m bar 0 n. But now this is amazing, isn't it? If I just get, ask you the question, what gender is the homology ring of m bar 0 n? Zero n you, you know. But you just have something downstairs which has all the nice properties you want, and you know that it has some lifting property, and with that, you actually can prove There's such a statement. It's really amazing. I don't know the proof. But if you're interested, please look, have a look. Okay. Um, now let's discuss, I think this is enough for marginalized pieces of curves with mark points on them. Let's discuss marginalized pieces of stable maps. So let's move to stable maps. Now again, at x, um, be a smooth projective righty, and this time we fix the cohomology class in integral cohomology of x. Integral homology of x, I'm sorry. Let's fix some homology class. Now let m, g, and x beta be the set of isomorphism classes isomorphism classes of pointed maps pointed maps um, let's call them uh, C B1 Bn this time our mark, marked curve or pointed curve comes with also a map um, where C is a projective non-singular curve of genus G curve of genus G Okay, and uh, what is the property of this map? And the map satisfies the fact that it maps the curve into the ambient non-singular projective variety such that push forward the homology class of homology class beta homology class of sorry homology class of C is equal to the class that you fix an integral homology of x. Okay? All right. And then um, I say set of isomorphism classes. What is that supposed to mean? So isomorphism here is translated as follows. So you have C, the, some curve C, P1, to Pn and a map F being isomorphic to some curve C prime, P1 prime, P prime N and some map F prime. If there is a if there is a scheme isomorphism, scheme theoretic isomorphism. OK, 
okay? Let's call it G that takes the curves to each other. So there must be a map from the curve to each other. And then it must obey the embeddings of each one of these curves into the amber variety. So if this is get mapped to by, by the map f to the x, and this gets mapped by the map f prime to the x, then there must be an isomorphism of the two curves that takes points of c to points of c prime, and this composition is somehow compatible composition. So what does that mean? It means that g must take pi to the p prime i, points to points, and and um, f prime OG is F. F prime OG is F. Okay, so that's the notion of isomorphism. Okay, again, for MGNX beta, you're looking at C, which is projective non singular curve. So for M bar GN, we discussed non singular curves. We added a compactification that took care of certain nodal singular curves. Same in here. There's an open locus that parameterizes maps of non-singular curves to an ambient variety. But again, these curves can become, you know, singular. And how badly can they become singular? That has been de being determined by the stability condition. So let us compactify this now. Okay, so, by the way, some, maybe some remark. Um, if this cohomology class beta is not equal to zero, the one we fix, then MGN um, X beta could still be empty space unless beta is a class of an algebraic curve, of a class of a curve. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You could fix cohomology classes which don't have curve geometric realization. Um, also, um, if genus is equal to zero, m g n x beta is equal to empty if beta is not equal to zero and x does not have, um, does not contain any rational curves, does not contain any rational curves. Meaning that fixing the cohomology class is even still itself not enough because it's a weak property of that curve. You can have examples where the ambient variety does not contain any rational curves. Genus zero curves are rational curves. So if, do you know examples of such things? Such varieties which... Anyone? Hmm? Varieties that don't contain rational curves. What? Varieties that don't contain rational curves at all? Yes. Yeah, a billion varieties. X, for instance, a billion varieties. There's different types of analyses that can go to this thing. And if you have an abelian variety X and you're embedding a rational curve isomorphic to P1 into X, you can actually show that this map, for those of you who are familiar with this term, curve is the Jacobian of that curve. If the curve is genus zero, if, if it is P1, its Jacobian is a point. So this map factors through a point, and that's a constant map, so you have nothing. You have no rational curve. There's another way of seeing it as two, is this is simply connected. So if you're like differential topology or something like that, it's simply connected. 
this thing gets mapped to the universal cover of your abelian variety, which is some C, some n-fold product of C, some n-dimensional complex plane, you know, C, C, C to the n. Um, but this is also complete. Complete. P1 is complete, so it, it gets mapped to the C to the n, but then the map will be constant again. So then the original map to x would be constant. If it's constant to the universal cover, it will be constant to the actual varieties. Things like that. OK. All right. OK, let's do. Um, There exists a compactification. MGNX beta. MGNX beta, and this is the moduli space. Stable of stable maps. This is the moduli space of pointed maps. Okay, so it parameterizes a set of isomorphism classes of these pointed maps from domain curves of, with n mark points via the isomorphism I row. There's no discussion of the stability. Then these things again become singular, and how badly they can become singular, that's realized by stability condition. Let's take a five minute break. Any questions? Who wants to contribute to this class? <laughs> Meaning that as we go along, you know, you can have others to come and lecture. You can do that. I would love it, in fact. <laughs> No, of course I will make it easy in the sense that I'll provide a wrap for the school because you know, people do 
those people who want to actually work on things, I'm sure it's constructive to take notes and you know, prepare. That's you want to do it? Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sure you can do it. Uh, you can do it too. You're a student, right? Yeah. Okay, you can solve it. You want to do it? Whatever. Whatever. What would you want to do? You can go to small quantum homology and so on. For some, you know, 3.3 probably. I don't know. Someone to push it out. I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned, this moduli space of pointed maps, the moduli space of a stable maps. Stability takes care of the how badly, how singular the curve can be. So let us give the definition of a stable map. So this is the first definition. Um, stable map. Um, and and pointed an endpointed stable map consists of um, a connected again connected curve, marked curve. Now we know what that means, marked curve, marked curve. It's a connected curve with n distinct smooth points on it. Or, you know, the curve actually could be singular itself, but the mark points need to be smooth points on the curve, distributed on the curve. And a morphism, and a morphism from C to X satisfying, satisfying the following conditions. Or the following properties. So, what are those properties? Um, one singularities of uh, the only, let me write it, the only singularities. The only singularities of C are ordinary double points. Ordinary double point singularity. Um, two, P1 to Pn are distinct. Um, ordered 
smooth points of C. Yeah, which was the case also for the marginalized piece of curve. So the markings need to be the smooth points. Even if the curve is singular, it could have nodes, and the nodes are ordinary dull point singularity, but the markings need to be smooth. And three, if CI is a component um, of C such that um, CI is isomorphic with the P1, the C is some curve of genus G and could have pieces inside of which which are genus zero curves isomorphic to P1 and F is uh, the map is constant F is constant on CI then CI contains at least three special points three special points that is either nodes or markings, either either nodes or mark points. Okay, so now this is kind of reminds us of the stability condition of components of this nodal curve having three special points, except here you can see that it also depends on the map. So if you have a component which is rational curve and the map sends it as a constant contracts it that component needs to be having three special points so another way of uh, maybe I add this and then I reinterpret this uh, this part if C um, has arithmetic genus um, 1 and n is equal to 0 then f is not constant so a stable map is a map from a pointed curve into the ambient variety which satisfies these four properties now especially the three and fourth properties are the ones which guarantee that this, this stable map, the image of the stable map is, is going to have finite automorphisms. So, let me add a remark. Equivalently, this is equivalent to saying um, that uh, one if E inside C is isomorphic to P1 certain connected component of this curve C and for any such such component E and C, uh, E is mapped to a point by F. Mapped to a point. This is this is a statement that F could be constant along the rational piece of subcomponent of C. If you have some components inside the curve, some of which are isomorphic to P1s and they are being mapped to a point by this map F, mapped to a point by F. So maybe if there exist EIs in C for any such component EI where EIs is mapped to a point, by F, then the I uh, must contain 
at least three special points. Furthermore, if the genus of these, this E is equal to 1, and uh, is being mapped to a point by F, then E has at least one special point. And this is more non-trivial, but a little bit of staring at it, you can see this is true. Maybe the other remark is, um, given the first two conditions, conditions in definition one, definition one, the third and fourth, the third and fourth um, are equivalent um, to the assertion that that this um, the assertion that the data C with its markings on the map has only finitely many automorphisms. Finitely many automorphisms. Okay. When n plus 2g is less than 3, 3 m bar gn does not exist. So in this case, all the stable maps All the statement maps have uh, have infinitely many autos. Again, we will discuss this later. So this this last piece, we, when we discuss about expected dimension of the moduli space, emptiness versus none. Of the module is, we, we come back to this thing. But th this is the most important part that the stability of the stable map has to do with finite automorphisms of the data of the <coughs> connected curve in the ambient variety. Okay? Okay. So, now, let's say we completely internalize. It takes time to internalize this stability condition. Again, it has to do with drawing pictures. Draw, you know, a marked curve with two connected components. And then, let's say, assume that one of the components has genus 1 and the other doesn't. And then ask yourself, how many of these markings should I really have on this curve? So this condition you need to obey. And then you will see on the, on the pieces where the connected component is a rational curve and it gets mapped to a point, you need to at least have three special points. And then that last piece, if the genus is one, then also you need to have at least one special point. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's discuss about families of the stable maps. After all, the moduli space is a way of you know, parameterizing objects. Moduli spaces are always given as families. So let's discuss what a family means. Definition two, family. 
to have a stable mass. Okay, let x be a, a projective um, non-singular algebraic variety, algebraic variety, and S the uh, scheme is going to be our parameterizing scheme over field of complex numbers. Okay, so there is this category of schemes over C which I keep using in the in future. So let's write it like that as the category of schemes over C and S is a member of this category. Is everyone familiar with algebraic geometry in this room? Who are people who have had one algebraic geometry course in this room? Really? <laughs> it's impossible. Raise your hand if you have had it. Okay, good. Like, what? <laughs> then it becomes totally illogical to my brain, cannot process why you're sitting here. <laughs> yes, but okay, good. Everyone has had algebraic geometry. Okay. So it's not so surprising to mention scheme, right? So, okay. Yes. Good. Okay, good. Um, let S be a parameterized scheme. Um, and endpointed, endpointed stable map over S. This is one way of saying a family of a stable maps parameterized by S. You can call it an endpointed stable map on S. So one stable map is an endpointed stable map on point. Point is a scheme. It belongs to the same category as the spectrum of the complex numbers. That's the zero-dimensional scheme. Now we would like to generalize it to any other scheme. So an endpoint to the stable map over S is a flat, proper morphism C of S to S, if you like together with with n sections together with n sections s1 to sn and a map such that for each geometric point For each geometric point, um, little s inside s, okay, the restriction let's call it f little f restricted to little s from c of s to restricted to little x, s to x to the geometric. Fibers, fibers of C big S over S in S um, okay C over S together with Sections. We will we will go over this again. So together with the images, the images of the section, a stable map, stable map to the x. Okay. So. If you look at, if you have, if you think of this as a family, a flat proper family of 
pointed curves parameterized by s, then obviously if you restrict this to a geometric point of s, you will get one of those pointed curves and get, naturally gets mapped to the x. So this morphism from c of s to x is understandable. And what makes it a family is basically that if I restrict it, this is this statement, if I restrict it to a geometric point, I get one of those statements. Okay. And, but, you know, sections are also understandable. So this needs to have n sections. So if this was a point, spec of C, if, if I have something like that, having a section means going backwards, right? So from a point, I can, when, if I give you a curve in algebraic geometry, you can have a point on that curve, mark points on that curve. But what is that really? A, how do you understand it? It's a map from a spectrum of complex numbers to the ambient curve. So it's a section map from point to the curve. So having n sections, if this is a point, completely gives you the markings on the curve. So now for a family, this is a family notion of that. So having n sections means for every geometric point of S, I'm associating n markings on the curve. And then I look at the whole thing. So I get all the sections on S. I think this is the most beautiful thing about language of Grothendieck, the functoriality of his constructions. Everything is a map, everything. Points, lines, any, any variety, everything is a map. Every scheme is given by map, in particular points. Okay, so um, furthermore, um, one, we say that f from this curve to x has um, genus g, genus g if for, I think these are obvious, right? So if for each geometric, if for each geometric point s inside s, the curve C little s has arithmetic genus has arithmetic genus G two um, again given a homology class. Given a homology class beta in H2 of x with integral coefficients, we say that f from c of s to x um, um, as class theta, um, if for, again, if for each geometric point, it has that class, right? So f little s star of the class of restriction of this family to the geometric point of s as class beta. And this is nice and smooth, right? OK. So um, as soon as you realize how to parameterize the stable maps by family, as, as in families, by members of category of schemes over complex numbers, for instance, the first immediate thing that comes to mind is to define a functor that takes you from category of schemes over the complex numbers to, to these objects. Each time you evaluate this functor at one of these schemes, you would like to have an S-flat proper family of stable maps parameterized by that scheme. That's the moduli functor. So then 
given um, beta in H2, we can define a contravariant functor, contravariant functor. Now, let me emphasize here, whenever I use curly M, it is the functor, or it's going to be later the modulized stack. When I write things with straight form, capital M, straight, straight M, that is the space, modulized space. This is for me the functor. M bar G N X beta takes me from this category of the schemes over the complex numbers to sets. <coughs> okay, um, which sends a test scheme or a scheme. S to the set of all um, isomorphism classes. So of all isomorphism classes of n pointed stable maps over S, which I just defined. Genus G and class beta. Genus G means for every geometric point of the test scheme, the corresponding pointed curve has genus G, and its, its class in the ambient variety is realized as beta. Any questions so far? The fact that certain functor can have a realization as a space is really deep. This is just a moduli functor. Later, the closest thing to a space that you can associate to this is a stack. And a stack has the underlying space whose points are given by the isomorphism classes of these stable maps. Okay? So it needs proving, basically, that when I define a functor like that, this functor from two categories, categories of schemes over C to categories of sets, this functor has a realization as a space. Okay? Who proved it? Okay, so. Alex CF, so there is this theorem. Definition theorem three. This is due to mainly due to Alexiev, Valery Alexiev, and Fulton and Pandre Pandy as well, prove it in a different way. In their notes you can find it. If X is projective and we fix some cohomology class. curve class in X, and there exists, then there exists a, this about properness of the moduli space, projective coarse moduli space, aha, uh -huh, so it's this space. This time I call it straight N bar GN, not curly, where M bar GN X beta is a scheme together with, together with a natural transformation 
natural transformation of functors. Okay, so curly M is a functor. Straight M is a scheme. So this belongs to the category of the schemes. And they prove that associated to that moduli functor, you can associate an underlying space, an honest thing that we understand using differential geometry, classical algebraic geometry, and so forth. And this is space, in order to define it, it comes with a functor. So let's, let us give that functor. And as soon as I put the functor, you will see. It makes sense. Um, so this functor is the phi functor. It's a transformation of functors. Okay? It's a map between functors. So it takes you from this functor I defined before, curly and bar, to another functor, hum, over the category of the schemes over C, um, blank, hum bar G and X beta. Right? Because this is a scheme. They proved that this is a scheme. So it makes sense to take hum between two schemes. So, satisfying um, the properties as follows. So, what happens if I evaluate this phi at a point? Phi of um, spec of C that is something that takes you from moduli functor evaluated at a point. Moduli functor always, that's what the stack really is also. Moduli functor or the stack always, as soon as you evaluate it on some element of this category, here it, here it is this category, this is also a map from this category to sets, it immediately spits out for you set of objects parameterized by that thing. So if you evaluate it at a point, set of objects parameterized by a point is one object only. It's one stable map. So um, this evaluation gives you a map to from here to spec of C to straight M bar G and X beta, which is a set by ejection. And, you know, now that we know about the spaces, the schemes, and algebraic geometry, again, by growth index construction of these things, this is a scheme. Every point of this scheme is always realized as a map. This is that map. You see? Everything is nice. It's so totally compatible. It's poetic. Right? So this gives you a stable map. This gives you a map from a spectrum of C2 here which gives you a point in this space, which is A is stable map. Okay. Okay, again, I know that you guys probably know these things, everyone, but for the sake of completeness, I just review them. Okay, two. If S is a scheme and you find another functor psi from M bar GN X beta, this is something like the universal properties of these moduli functors, to hum blank to S is a natural transformation transformation of functors okay. um, 
then there exists a unique morphism of the schemes What is that morphism? Let's call it gamma. They proved that this is a scheme, so it now makes sense. This is a morphism of the schemes from here to S, such that um, such that psi is equal to something called gamma tilde O phi, where gamma tilde from is defined by is, is the map from home blank. Oh, let me see. Does this make sense? Yes. And more GNX data to um, S is the natural transformation induced by yeah. didn't like this these two last lines, that's fine. All of this theorem is saying that to this functor, you can associate a space um, and this space parameterizes the stable maps or families of stable maps. If you, so, if you evaluate the functor at a point, it gives you a stable map. If you evaluate it as a, at a scheme, a test scheme S, it gives you an S flat proper family of stable maps. So basically, you're saying to that stack that you define, there exists a unique scheme such that it that it meets. Oh, sorry, that it's universal among the schemes that it makes map to, and yes, that it yes. agrees on the points of all. That's like right. Exactly. Exactly. What type of stack? What do you mean when you say stack of the curly M, the Artin stack? Curly M. Yes. Uh, curly M. In here, this curly M is a delete mode for this okay. stack. Oh. Because of the finiteness of the automorphisms groups. Going from a delete mode for the stack to a space. Um, it's just the realization of the fact that if your automorphism groups are finite and they have only one element. Okay, if you wanted to prove something is a space or a scheme, how far is it from being a dilemma for the stack is that? Okay, a scheme is also a dilemma for the stack with the difference that it's a stabilizer group of points that the scheme parameterizes have only one element. Identity versus Artinus stacks, which you can have infinitely groups of stabilizer groups with infinite cardinality. Okay, um, in fact, to make this uh, more complete, this is due to Kansevich. If X is uh, Projective, beta is again non zero, same setup. Um, then the functor, functor, m bar gn, curly m bar gn x beta, is an algebraic stack. Algebraic stack proper over C Furthermore, he also proved that 
this m mm, curly m bar zero n pr projective r space is a smooth stack. Smoothness is realized by studying the tangent sheaf of, of the moduli space. If the sheaf is a bundle, doesn't jump in dimension, it has this flatness property, then the scheme will be smooth. Otherwise, the singularities of the underlying scheme is realized by the jumps in the dimension. So, we will discuss it in future, you will see that this projective R space has something called convexity. It's a convex space. That's the convexity of this thing guarantees that the tangent sheaf of the moduli space is, is going to be globally generated. So it's, it will be a bundle. I don't know where, but I know that I have written this note. So I don't know. It's not here, but later, yeah. So what is a algebraic stack? Hmm? Can you give us a definition? Algebra, oh. <coughs> so stack is often a contrafarian functor from the category of schemes over the base field. Here is the, going to be the complex numbers. Okay? Two sets. Um, and this thing is a two category. It's a two category. So meaning that not only it sends members of the category of schemes over complex numbers are schemes over complex numbers. Not only this, this, this functor sends a scheme to a family of objects parameterized by that scheme, it also sends morphisms to morphisms of those things. That's why it's a two functor. And it had group weight sections. So when you fix a scheme, it has sections, but these sections are group weight sections. So morphisms are isomorphisms. And often these things are realized as quotient stacks, because these things also have constructions via GIT and so on. So you can also think about quotient stacks. And then quotient stack is an honest example of an algebraic stack. Again, quotient stack has also realized itself as a two-functor fibered over the category of schemes of the scene. This thing is actually one of those things. It's a representable stack. It's represented by the coarse modulus. If, so if what that was... By proper and smooth mm. for a functor? Yeah, it means finite type. Smoothness is realized by looking at the tangent sheaf of the stack. If it is a bundle, everywhere you go, it is a smooth. Properness is something like properness of the schemes. You can use different criteria to test it, like finite typeness of the scheme. So fiber-wise, it needs to be proper. Um. OK, remark. Every algebraic stack. Um, there are plenty of other algebraic stacks. I don't know. Plenty. I don't know actually. Other than quotient stacks, what are the algebraic stacks other than quotient stacks? Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Certainly, this is one of those. This has a realization as a quotient stack. So, you basically look at the scheme that parameterizes the scheme. Uh, the, stable maps, and you take the stack theoretic quotient of this thing via a group of automorphisms of these things. That's a quotient stack. It just turns out miraculously that the coarse moduli space associated to this thing is also the moduli space of the stable maps, which itself could have a GIT construction. On one side, you're taking the stack theoretic quotient. On the other side, you take the GIT quotient. But these two things are related by the functor I put here, by Alex C. F. and so on. 
Okay. Every algebraic stack has an underlying underlying algebraic space. And the um, underlying algebraic space of this stack, M bar G and X beta, is the coarse marginal space. This is that statement, which is the miracle, really. I mean, it's really hard to prove. <laughs> you agree with me? Yeah? Is um, the coarse moduli space straight m bar g and x beta. If you look at the notes of Fulton and Pondery Ponde, you will see how many pages they spent to prove this via GIT. That the coarse moduli space associated to the honest stack is this GIT quotient. Taking the GIT quotient is really hard. You need to look at the stable locus. You need to look at Mumford Hilbert criteria of stability and all of those things. Taking the stack theoretic quotient is much, 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 much easier. Let's just use the definition. Between the two, I think, is amazing. Okay. All right. So, um, so yes. So, this is that. We have. Maybe 15 minutes. Let me mention some examples. So today we talk about definitions, some, some theorems and so on, constructional theorems. And then uh, next session, starting from next session, we move to looking at, looking at these spaces in, in their tangent and obstruction levels, studying tangent obstruction theories virtual fundamental classes, and eventually, we need all of these ingredients to define invariants. Okay, example one. When x is a point, now that we are all convinced that straight m bar g and x beta is nice thing that represents this functor or a stack, Let's mention some examples of that. So if x is a point, then there, there cannot be any curve inside a point. So beta is equal to 0. And m bar gn point 0 is the space that parameterizes curves of genus g with n mark points on them, all of which are getting Okay, then you can have uh, x being a projective space. Then you can look at m bar g n p r. Um, yeah, so this may be a notation. Actually, it's good for notation. So notation actually also. Um, so you can have can define something like this, where d times l, l is the class of a line, line in PR. Now, notationally, this is the same as sometimes they call it m bar g and PR d. So no, we always, in the modular space of a stable mass, we all, always have a cohomology class. So they, they call this a space of degree D maps. It really means that the map is from some curve to D times class of a line. It always is a cohomology class there, but I don't know. I think this is a little bit sloppy, but I don't know. Putting one extra L in here wouldn't really be taking so much energy. But anyways, it's notation. It's being used by the creators of this field, so we respect them. <laughs> okay, so that's the notation. And for this, let me mention some examples of these things. So, for instance, let g be equal to 0, n equal to 0. Rational curve, so m bar 0, 0, p 
PR, rational curves inside projective R space with class 1 times the class of a line. So it's a line, send it to here. Degree 1 maps from a curve into here. Do you know what this is? Degree 1 maps from P1 in PR. P1 is one dimensional, PR is R dimensional. And the map does nothing to the curve. So what is that? Excellent. It's the Grassmannian. One-dimensional subspaces of the R-dimensional complex projective sub, uh, space. So then we can have, we can keep the genus equal to zero and be bigger than zero, bigger than or equal to one. Okay? And we can discuss m bar zero n pr again one, degree one maps. This is a locally, this is this is harder, much harder to analyze, it's not that easy. Locally trivial vibration. Vibration over this Grassmannian, over this Grassmannian of P1 inside PR. Locally trivial vibration over the Grassmannian, and the fibers are fibers given by um, stable. Degenerations um, this is the notation for it. These were defined by Fulton and MacPherson. It is some sort of successive blow up of the n-fold product of P1 with itself along its diagonals. And it has an inductive construction. It's a mouthful, so I wouldn't put it in here. This is just expository, so just what you can remember from this is that this is this is much more non-trivial than this. But it's fiber vibration over the grass money. The fibers are given by this. It's a beautiful paper, actually. I mean, it it's also gets related to Hilbert's small points on the this one. You have some variety X, the stable degenerations of X for given choice of N could be related to the Hilbert small points on that right. Okay, um, then you could have, you could change the space. So PR, let us just do this. You can change the degree as well. So let us, we can also discuss M bar 0, 0, no markings, only rational curves inside P2 with degree 2. And this is the last example of today. Curves of degree 2 or whose homology of the image is 2 times class of a line inside P1, P2, 2 times class of P1 with no markings inside here. So how do you study it? Well, you know, one way of studying it, that this is a space of the stable maps. You remember that there is a forgetful map from here to, if you forget the map information, F. If you forget F, you're left with M bar degree 2 curves inside the P2. So you can at least know what those are. Right? So, so for instance, um, the open set... Let's do it this way. The open set M00 P22 inside here uh, consists of <coughs> consists of non-singular degree two maps in P2, right? So non-singular conic curves, D 
These are curves, dimension 1, ambient space is P2, so these are divisors. Non-singular, conic curves, given as divisors inside P2. Unique optical equivalence. Okay, so these look like this. Non-singular conics. And then, um, of course, this is the interior of that moduli space. And for the boundary, then you need how can I send the P1 onto a singular conic inside P2. Right? Because this map needs to become eventually singular, a nodal thing. You want to map this thing inside P2 such that it's degree 2. Um, so, let's discuss singular conics. So, singular um, conics, D, uh, inside P2, are union of two lines meeting transversely. Okay, so they look like this inside P2. Now you would like, your goal is to map a P1 into things like that. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you can map P1 to this line or to this line. Fix one of them. The only thing that you need to do is you need to ask your P1 to meet one of these lines at a point. So the data of this is fix a line in P2 and basically tell me the point of intersection. All right? So, so F from C to P2 for such a thing uh, to determine, to, de to determine F from C to P2 for, for C, for, okay, for such a thing, okay, we need to say of intersection is the intersection with one of the lines is that data is given as a P1 with a point on it okay there is a third possibility also that you send your curve, domain curve isomorphic to P1, into a line inside P2 such that the map is degree 2, 2 to 1 cover of that line inside P2. That's also a possibility, right? This could be a degree 2 thing inside P2, which is a, non, a singular um, thing given by the transverse intersection of two lines inside P2. This Data takes care of sending a line into one of those things, so you need to specify a point on one of the lines. Or you can just take a line inside P2, ask the map to be degree 2, so the image will be a 2 to 1 cover of that line. So also we could have. So we could also have a map from P1 to a line in P2 where this is a 2 to 1 cover, 2 to 1 branch covering of degree 2. So we need to just specify, take a line in P2, give me exactly the location of those two points on which you're constructing your branch cover. Data of which, data of which is given by a line and the points of the branching. So location of branch points. This line is this line. So I claim that if you tell me the two points, then 
you've done it. You send the P1 on to this line, but as a 2 to 1 cover of this line branch over these two points. That gives you naturally a degree 2 map. So this modular space is given by the set of smooth things, which are the interior, the data of lines with one point on them, that is those P1s which are, whose image meets these singular conics, and the data of such things, those are those curves, which are 2 to 1 cover of a line inside P2. This is the classical space of conic. Okay, so that's, I think, maybe the first non-trivial, but nevertheless, at least, uh, I mean, easy to do example of the moduli space of the stable maps. And so let us start, uh, stop here, and uh, next time we go over tangent obstruction complex. Thanks. Any questions? Cheers.